layers here are some people for scale and they are forming all these folds and the yellow lines which I've drawn here are the axial planes so what I try to do is I try to interpret this structure I've drawn in the green layers which go like this and the yellow are the axial planes Okay, and now the, the final but very important aspect of folds is that they can form a cleavage, an axial plane cleavage. In German it is called Schichtung und Schieferung, layering or bedding and cleavage. So here in this case is your layering and this here is a cleavage which the rock has developed due to the folding. And this cleavage in most cases is more or less in the direction of the axial plane. Okay, so here is my fold. And then the cleavage is like this. Sometimes there is a little bit of fanning, like this. Sometimes, there's, sometimes there are quite complicated structures. You don't get the cleavage in rocks if you don't have mica. Of course, the cleavage is simply that the deformation at the micro scale flattens the rock fabric and parallelizes all the micas. So this rock doesn't have a good cleavage. But here, all the micas are more or less parallel oriented. So if you hit the rock, it will fracture along that plane. And this is what happens when you develop cleavage in a rock. And here is a very beautiful example of a thin section. So this is about two or three centimeters, where you can actually see the layer going across. And these lines here are the cleavage which was formed by tectonics. So this cleavage was not there before the folding. And what you can do with this cleavage is you can use it to analyze structures in the field. So let me see if I can make a drawing for you here. So let's assume that I have a structure in the field which looks like this and here is another layer of sandstone and here is another one and in the clay between the sandstone I have this cleavage And here. Now, of course, most of the time when you go into the field, you don't see this. You just see a few outcrops. Okay? So this is what you might see. These are your outcrops now. And your task is now to reconstruct which is hidden. Okay? So now you can try to do something with the orientations of the layers. But what you can also note is that here there is a different asymmetry between the layering and the cleavage. 
Here, if I want to rotate the cleavage through the layering, I have to go to the, with the clock. And here, I have to go against the clock. So I know that this side is on this limb of a fold, and this side is on the other one. So somewhere in between here, I must have an axial plane. Okay? Here, I actually see the axial plane, so that's quite easy. But here, again, I can go right is the clock, and here it's against the clock. So in between these two, I must have an axial plane. And therefore, you can try to reconstruct it like that. Okay? So you can use this asymmetry between the cleavage and the layering to figure out how the folded structure in the profile works. And this could well be one of the little exam questions that you will get at the end of the semester. So let's take a few minutes break. So to illustrate uh, this development of the dominant wavelength in the folding, I'm going to show you a few computer simulations by a colleague of mine, uh, Stefan Schmalholz uh, from the ETH Zürich. And what he has done is he made computer models basically showing this block, the soft viscosity and the hard viscosity. And then he shortens his models with the computer like that. So let's have a look. What happens first is the layer shortens and develops a little bit of instabilities. Okay, this is where you already select the right wavelength. And then there is a lot of shortening and now the folds have really formed. And from this on, the folds are just growing. They get bigger and bigger. But they don't change their wavelength, except by deformation. This simulation here has a layer which is thicker, and the viscosity contrast is higher. So you can see that the layer almost chooses the maximum wavelength which is possible. And this simulation here shows you some of the complexities that you get when you have multi-layers. So the layers cannot make their own wavelength, they have to keep account what the others want. So they have to have a democratic election and find a wavelength. So here, each individual layer could have formed shorter waves. But together, they have their own group behavior. And now the wavelength is larger. And you can see now that after the fold has been tightened, you get a lot of complications. Because here on the outside, there is still a lot of uh, easy ways to deform. But in the center, the fold is almost completely closed. And at this point, the rock is very difficult to fold more. So the folds get deformed themselves. And the whole rock is now just kind of stretching in this direction. Okay, cut. <laughs> okay, so the, the second part of the lecture is about shear zones. Shear zones are zones in which the rock in a ductile fashion, deforms by simple shearing, like this. And the deformation in these shear zones can be very, very large, and the rock is going to be transformed into what is called a myelinite, a rock which is completely determined by this shearing. And here I brought you an example from one of our mapping areas. This is a shear zone. And you can see that the rock is bended. It has a very, very well-developed cleavage, if you want, or foliation. 
And this is completely a consequence of very, very large shearing. So it is a kind of a family of the folding. It is a ductile deformation, but the strains are very, very large. So let's go to the first example. This is one that I made uh, using Photoshop to show you the evolution. This is just a scan of a granite. And then I sheared it. You can try it at home. It's very easy. There is a Photoshop filter which will do this for you. And you can see that already you are developing this bending. And if you shear the rock more, then you get the bending better and better developed. And you can imagine that if I would shear it to a very, very large deformation, you would get something like this. Okay? So this whole bending is not a sedimentary layering, it's a completely formed by deformation. So just a little quiz. If I have simple shear, so my block, which used to look like this, now is deformed into this here. Okay. What is the D tensor? that describes this deformation. If my horizontal axis is x1 and the vertical axis is x2, the D tensor is 1, gamma, 0, 1, like this, and gamma is the tangent of this angle psi. Okay. If you want to learn more about this, please use the spreadsheet stress and strain which we have provided to you where you can put in any number of comma and you can see the deformation. Okay. So shear zones are the places in the earth where in a ductile fashion very, very large shear deformations are formed. Shear zones are basically the ductile versions of faults in the upper crust. And shear zones, just like faults, come at all kinds of scales. And here are some examples. This is a map. Here is about one kilometer, so this whole area is maybe three kilometers of shear zones mapped like this in a high-grade metamorphic rock outcrop. Okay? What you see is that these shear zones kind of come together and go apart. They form these lensoid structures. This is also called anastomosing. Anastomosing. And now I show you another map of shear zones in the South American Craton. Okay? And here the scale is hundreds of kilometers. And you can see that the pattern of these shear zones is very similar to the pattern which was made at the one kilometer. And in fact, if you would now zoom in and look at the detail here somewhere, you would find the same pattern, so again, just like faults, shear zones form self-similar patterns. <coughs> there is one very important consequence of this shearing, and that is that objects which don't want to deform, so for example, if there is a hard rock in 